Now I want to bring on Christina Romines from Women's Action for New Directions. We probably know them as WAND. Hi, everyone. I am Christina Romines. I am the field director of WAND. Um, I'm really excited to be here today um, with you all. Um, there's so much to do. There's so much to learn. Um, I'm particularly fired up after that um, past um, presentation. Um, one of my favorite quotes um, is that um, power concedes nothing without demand. Uh, it never has and it never will. I believe that was Frederick Douglass that said that. And so um, always really grateful to have um, folks like Code Pink around to really demand it. Um, so um, first, I wanted to give a shout out to um, all the students and um, like newish to the issue people um, in the room. Um, I hope you all are feeling OK, feeling um, not too confused, not too overwhelmed. Um, I wanted to give you a shout because I, um, so it, where where you might be at is it resonates with me. Um, I uh, my background is not in nuclear weapons um, policy. It is in um, uh, movement building and and strategic organizing, um, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, sort of with the lens of Juan's political initiatives. So since this conference is intended to broaden the constituency of those who oppose uh, the use of nuclear weapons and are willing to actively advocate for peaceful solutions to international conflict. Um, that's what I, I wanted. That's what I wanted to talk about. Um, so usually my jam is um, talking about privilege, intersectionality. That is the language that I use. Um, my communities are women, people of color, the queer community, and beyond institutional, um, organizational affiliations, um, there are many people who fall into all of either of those communities. There are communities that are already very active, really appreciate what Jonathan said um, about, um, we don't know that they don't care about nuclear weapons or war. They just have very immediate um, issues. Um, they may care very deeply, but based on their experiences, um, mobilizing for just themselves and the recognition of their own humanity, feel overwhelmed. And so what I want to talk to you about today um, is about the changing um, nature of organizing and of power in general. And so what I'm not talking about is the difference between uh, pamphlets and social media. It's actually much deeper than that. It's about um, uh, old power values and new power values. So um, I think, um, and I'll speak for myself, a lot of the organizations I've worked for have been um, around 50 years old, have used a chapter-based model, um, and that's worked for a long time. Now, what we're seeing um, with um, the Women's March or Me Too or um, Black Lives Matter is that it is not so much about um, creating uh, creating platforms or creating more organizations. It's about creating ideas. And it is not about um, getting victories um, for like ourselves or organizations, but like the model that you're putting forward, how scalable is it? How easy is it for other people to adopt and move forward? And if you are successful, it outgrows you. And that's scary. I think that's scary for um, even just myself, who has been organizing professionally for six years. That runs counter to how I think about um, coalition work um, and other strategies for organizing. Um, so, with um, so, what does it mean for me to work intersectionality? Uh, it means to work. We work collectively um, as women, people of color, the LGBTQIA plus community, and allies to challenge why certain voices or approaches are seen as the only expert or credible ones. That's a big barrier, um, not only for this movement, but for everyone. Um, so I'll talk about women specifically, because uh, it's in the name of my org. It's the first name, uh, the first word. Uh, um, so why women? Is it because we are better? 
Well, according to the research, yes. Um, <laughs> I can point to several uh, studies of peace processes that show that, one, when women are involved in them, um, they are much more likely to see, succeed, ugh, succeed. But unfortunately, uh, the other data points show that women are historically not included in these processes. Um, but all that being said, um, I don't actually believe that, that women are inherently better or maternal or more peaceful um, or more nurturing. Um, I can tell you that because uh, as a woman, I do a subpar job of taking care of only myself. <laughs> um, but what it really is is that women in other communities, but women are disproportionately more impacted by conflict and violence. Um, so uh, several examples just within nuclear. With nuclear testing, the direct health impacts run the gamut from cancer to birth defects to infertility, and they overwhelmingly impact communities who are economically or geographically marginalized. Um, one of the backgrounds that I come from is from um, the reproductive justice background, and so to me, that fits, because part of reproductive justice includes the right to bear and raise healthy children, free from violence. That's part of that, um, and I think that needs to be more a more um, a conversation that we're all having more. Um, and, and secondly, um, just on nuclear po policy um, and approaches, I feel that um, when, um, as, a, as a country, or even as a movement, when we talk about these things, uh, we fall back on some, some frames. So um, I think particularly for women, what we saw in the last presidential election was um, what is the common refrain um, for like why women can't be president? They're too emotional, they're naive, they're irrational, impulsive, they're easily baited. Sound familiar? Um, and, and for us at WAND, that really fed into um, our work um, at the beginning of the year with our Disarm the Patriarchy campaign um, that I hope um, many or some of you have, have seen already. Uh, we developed these posters uh, to take to the Women's March. Um, they were beautifully designed. On one side they say, disarm the patriarchy, because that is the language that this community speaks. Um, and instead of saying, like, you know, Soul authority or all these other things, like they don't they don't speak that language. Um, and so I need to speak to them in, in, in their language. So um, fed up with nuclear button me measuring contests. That's what the other side um, of it said. And people loved it. And um, I cannot tell you the amount of people who probably didn't think too much about nuclear weapons, or when they did think about it, they were like, this is scary, and then sort of felt helpless and, and left it there. Um, we can't leave these people behind anymore if we hope to succeed. So, um, so I talked about the Women's March posters. Um, what we did immediately after the Women's March um, was we hosted a tweet chat on um, using the hashtag disarm the patriarchy. You can still go read it. Um, I, I would recommend, um, we, we posted it on the Ms. Magazine blog, so if you search Ms. Magazine and then Disarm the Patriarchy, it'll, it'll come up right away. But what it was was a, um, a platform for women who work on nuclear policies to talk about um, why it's important to them, for some of the reasons I just mentioned, um, and uh, to talk about uh, things that we really understand, so like mansplaining, um, the, uh, and uh, when different approaches are seen as like, oh, not, you know, naive, you know, it, it sort of has, if you're familiar with the um, term gaslighting, it's a thing that like happens to women a lot. It's a psychological tactic where someone makes you feel like you're crazy for feeling the way you feel. Um, society <laughs> gaslights me just consistently. Um, and so it, it, that's a framework that you can sort of talk about with, with that community. Um, and then just to plug, um, the, the third piece that's coming out of this campaign that's still going is um, we're working on creating a, um, a guide that is very entry level um, because we don't want to leave these folks behind um, because they're really with it when you talk about it in their language. But as soon as we get into um, 
some policy weed areas, we sort of lose them. And what we end up doing accidentally is reinforcing this notion that uh, these issues are only for the experts or for the privileged or um, that we just shouldn't bother because um, Congress is never going to do what we want them to do. Well, there are some great solutions I already heard of. Uh, if you don't think that Congress is going to do what we think they need to do, like we can just divest. Like we can go that route, or we could put in the work to not only build a constituency within um, within Congress by getting them elected, and then saying, hey, we elected you, and this is, the, this is the, the bare minimum that we expect. We expect you to be good on this bill. We expect you not to take money from these folks. Um, so yeah, um, so making sure that they can still uh, uh, be involved in that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to uh, say that mitigating the escalating like machismo in the US North Korea relations is a critical area for women um, but all of the communities that I mentioned uh, to have a transformative role um, and some of the ways that we did all these things were around the time of the Olympics we wrote a letter to the unified um, Korean women's hockey team because sports are fun and like that's a base entry point for folks. And um, there were some South Koreans um, who were really not happy because they knew their team had worked really hard to get there and they didn't appreciate sort of what was happening. And there weren't enough voices to say, we love what's happening and we're cheering for you. So like, they weren't sure how they felt about being these pawns for political, geopolitical machinations. Um, but a lot of people would relate and say, I'm, still, I'm proud of them. And, I, and that, this is a great model that we could all um, take over. Uh, similarly, we're about to send a letter to the administration. We sort of in our office call it jokingly, like our binders full of women. Um, but currently going into these um, North Korea, um, US North Korea talks um, in May, we, we, we do not currently have an ambassador uh, to South Korea, nor a special representative to, to North Korea. Um, and so essentially what we said is, this is what diplomacy requires, a long and sustained effort. You need a team. You already signed the Women, Peace, and Security Act, so um, we're going to use that as leverage, and we're going to give you a whole list of women who are really qualified. Will he read that letter? Who's to say, but it does build power for our communities. So my time is up, so I have to leave it there. Um, but please feel free to come talk to me um, afterwards, um, not necessarily about nuclear policies, but about organizing strategies, because that's my bread and butter. Thanks. Right now, and it's a new campaign, so it's a great idea, um, two levels. One is... The, the big five, so Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, and General Dynamics, because they are so significant, and Bill Hartung told us those were the ones to focus on, right? So if I tell you Honeywell, Yes. <laughs> so we're going to now do Honeywell. <laughs> no, we really look to Bill for, uh, for guidance, so we should talk about it. We, we pick the big five, and then we have... Um, we are, are, are getting the whole big screen that includes uh, companies that uh, have at least, um, I think it is 10% of their profit coming from weapons. And so that's a whole slew of companies. Um, but I am totally open to the idea of Honeywell. So thank you for bringing it up. Any other questions? 